welcome. It's great to hear such energy in the house. <laughs> Hopefully you're all talking about the films you've seen or are about to see. Uh, and not only about like World Cup <laughs> stuff. Um, my name is Peter Stein, I'm Senior Programmer for Frameline 38, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the very first panel in our series called New Storytelling in LGBT Cinema. We've been really thrilled to uh, have, a, uh, have support from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Oscars folks, uh, to take a look with uh, a set of screenings and as you are here for free panel discussions, uh, at uh, New Directions in LGBT Storytelling. Obviously, you know the panel you're here to, uh, to uh, hopefully not just listen to, but also participate in, is gonna be taking a look at um, history and biography and how we're telling our own stories uh, and how that those uh, approaches have changed. Uh, also, just alerts that tomorrow there's uh, a panel at this very same time right here uh, on uh, basically how the digital world is changing uh, queer cinema with regard especially to um, from production and, and funding and distribution. Uh, and on Thursday there'll be a di uh, discussion with some really um, fantastic uh, established uh, queer women filmmakers as well as emerging artists uh, who are telling stories uh, from, the, uh, from, from new perspectives. So that's all part of this initiative, which has included some retrospective screenings. Uh, and it's uh, something of an experiment for Frameline to start doing um, uh, some, some of this might be considered professional development or services to the filmmaking community, but also stories that I think are, and subjects that are of interest to a general audience. So I actually wanted to know, first of all, how many of you here um, consider yourselves filmmakers or media makers? Wow, fantastic. So um, for the re let the record show that about um, more than half the audience has raised, has raised their hands. And how many of you are um, either professionally or in any kind of um, you know, vocational way uh, doing work or interested in queer history or LGBT history? Also, at least half of you. Well, the intersection is great because that's what we're going to be talking about today: is filmmaking and telling uh, telling uh, stories about our our shared and diverse queer past. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I, I we're not going to spend a lot of time on the panel doing lengthy introductions. We've got wonderful and um, accomplished filmmakers. That's why we handed out the little sheets. If anybody does not have a sheet that uh, gives the little biographies on the back, just raise your hand and one of the volunteers will bring one, bring one to you. There's one that's needed on the, on the, on the aisle there. Um, and so instead of, of lengthy introductions, I thought I'd give you a little taste of some of the filmmaking talents um, by showing you a few clips of, of representative films made by each of our filmmakers. Nancy Cates, Stefan Haupt, Don Perry, Don Logsdon. I snuck in a clip of a film that I made that actually Don Logsdon edited, so we're kind of getting a two for one. Um, and then they also in different ways show different approaches to excavating LGBT history. So um, we're, let me make sure I've gotten all of our announcements uh, going. Uh, this is, uh, one thing I want to be sure, this is meant to be really a conversation among the five of us that, that includes you as well. Um, so we don't want to just leave only five minutes for, for questions and all. We are recording it, so uh, your presence here is, I hope, is consent for us to be able to, uh, at some point, upload and, and or podcast uh, this conversation because I think it'll be it'll be useful for folks who are thinking about um, how we tell our stories. Um, but I do encourage you, if you're at the back, to come forward, um, uh, and we'll make it a we'll make it a, a conversation. Um, and one other thank you to, to all the folks at the Roxy who've opened up their, their house uh, earlier than Frameline is usually here to uh, allow us to have these, uh, these weekday screenings. It's really nice to be here. Um, okay, so to get us in the mood, let's have a look at um, a few clips from documentaries. So I'm gonna ask our four panelists to come on up, please. Uh, help me welcome Don Perry, producer and co-writer. Stephen Haupt, writer and director of The Circle. John Logston, co-director of Big Joy and many other films. And Nancy Cates, director of The Garden Season Sontag, Brother Outsider. So a reminder that there's waters by your, by your heels there. Um, so, uh, 
queer history is a big story, many stories, uh, that present some challenges for filmmakers because we're dealing a lot with an absence of imagery, something that comes up in, in Don and, and your partner Thomas Allen Harris's film with regard to the black family album, but also the gay family album. Uh, so I want to just start by asking maybe uh, each of you what challenge or challenges you faced um, in telling or unearthing gay history um, as, as filmmakers, as, as presenting something in a visual medium. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll start with that uh, because it's not totally evident from the clip uh, just how much of, of black gay history we were able to find as well in, as part of the film. But that's partly because, as, as, as we said in the, the, the intro, uh, all the secrets are hidden in the family photograph album. And so in order to tell these stories, we've had to make a very concerted effort to excavate that photo album and to bring those images forward. Um, and, and that in and of itself is, uh, is very sensitive because people don't often want to share their family photograph with the world. And especially if they're sharing things with the world that they are still processing. We certainly have ran, run into that, that issue a lot as well. One of the vignettes in, this, in the film uh, is the fact that uh, Thomas's grandfather takes an incredible amount of photographs, uh, starting when he's a very, very young man, photographing his family in Albany, and then throughout his courtship years with his future wife, and then just as the family's growing up. But he never took any photographs of his wife's cousin, whose name was Sugar and whom he had to bail out of, uh, of, of very tough situations on a frequent basis. We have absolutely no idea what sugar looked like other than family history, family stories. Um, but fast forward about 30 or 40 years, and we have some photographs of his, his father's sister. Um, and his father's sister, it turns out, uh, is, is a dyke, a stone cold dyke, and it's perfectly evident in all the photographs, but there aren't that many photographs of her either. And so those images were not the first thing that his mother, in going through the family photograph album, was, were bringing out. He had to recall those stories and then go dig for them. And, and I think that process of digging is something that a lot of people have had to do but we had to create a space where it was safe for them to share those images. And it was kind of like onesies and twosies. You do it here, you do it there, and a little bit, and a little bit, and a little bit, and then suddenly, wow, we've got an archive. I'm wondering, um, it really could go to, to any of the three of you. Um, I, I know that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Stefan. Um, you were telling a story where there was almost willfully no visual record for the story of the Circle der Kreis, this uh, uh, homophile uh, publication and, and society in Switzerland in the 50s. Um, and I'm curious how that then pushed you to make the kind of film that you did and choose, choose a genre, as we saw in the clip of kind of docudrama. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the, whether the, you could even try to get a sense uh, of, archi of the archival reality <laughs> Um, as opposed to doing a, something fiction or recreated? Well, I have to say that we, first of all, we wanted to do a fiction film based on the story of Rabbi and Ernst, but it was a financial question that we couldn't fund, fund it fin finally, so we decided we'd try it this way. And uh, the two old protagonists, Rabbi and Ernst, they talk very openly about everything. It's unbelievable, uh, with all the details you ever wanted to know. But of course, we had a lot of archive material concerning the, the magazine, of the, the circle, the, all these issues are conserved, but no photographs to it, because it was not allowed to take pictures, of course, uh, or to film during these balls that, and parties that sometimes, obviously, had up to 800 people coming. and. Uh, but when listening to Revian Dance, it was always clear that these 
parties, these balls were sort of the heart of the circle. And uh, we needed to have images of that, so that it was, at that moment it was clear we should try to bring this on stage. And now when they saw the film, they were a little bit disappointed and said, uh, why did you only have uh, such a little crowd? It was much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, a financial question. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll skip Dawn only because I have a direct, immediate follow-up for you, Nancy. Uh, you've, you've, in your last two films, uh, a biography of Bayard Rustin, a biography of, of Sontag, um, uh, you've, you've chosen two pub very public figures, and nonetheless, in dealing with their sexuality, this was something that was not f necessarily front and center in the way they talked about themselves, um, or, or in, given their histories, given the time periods they lived in, what was um, available uh, information. So I'm curious um, what strategies you use to actually un unearth that and bring that onto the screen. With both Rustin and Sondheim, I mean, they didn't even take pictures with their lovers. I mean, maybe there's like, there are, I think there are two or three pictures of Susan with one of her lovers, same-sex lovers. Even, there was not, we couldn't even get a picture of her with her husband. I mean, part of it was we didn't have access to her family photographs. We had her sister's archive, but not her son's archive. Um, but, you know, it's the same, it's really the same problem. But, I mean, if we were joking because there's an amateur, um, filmmaker named Hal O'Neill, who donated his, his materials to the GLBT, is that, is that the right order, uh, Historical Society, and we've all used the Hal O'Neill footage in our films. I mean, is it in the Castro as well? So, yeah, yeah. Well, right. So, there's a story so, about that. So like, if, if you're in the film world, you've seen this footage probably too many times. But the funny thing about Susan Sontag is that she might have actually been talking about that very scene at that bar, because that footage is from 1948, which is the year that Harriet happens to be telling that story. Um, so we did. I did actually a lot of research about this. There's a, a book called Wide Open Town by Nan Boyd, which talks about um, gay, the gay bar scene in San Francisco. And the historical society happens to have cocktail napkins, and they have these amazing things that they were catalogs of drag queens. Like if you went to certain um, bars in the late '40s in San Francisco, you could you could get like a program. It was like the playbill of the drag queens, <laughs> and you know they're extraordinary. They had wonderful graphic design in their cover and stuff. But yeah, you know, I mean, ironically, the most information we have about Rustin's sex life is partly from the FBI recordings of his phone. Um, and with Sontag, it was a more complicated thing because she, you know, she published her son has published her diaries after her death, and she gave her or she sold her papers to UCLA. So actually, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages about her being heartbroken over some girlfriend, but it's, there's no footage, and there's, there are very few photographs. So, I mean, that became a central part of our work, was the difference between the public Sontag and the private Sontag. Um, and that includes her family of origin as well. That I think the biggest reveal in the Sontag film is the picture of her at the age of three, not the girlfriends. <laughs> because Sontag pretended that she had sprung from the head of Zeus, fully formed, you know, like <laughs> Athena. Um, but I do think that, that one of the difficulties of making these films, I mean, not, um, sorry. I'm a little caught up here. My, for, my, for, a <laughs> film, for a filmmaker, you need to be okay. especially <laughs> aware of the mic. I like to be back there, not up here. <laughs> um, you know, she just really didn't want anyone to see, to see that side of herself. And so, you know, it becomes this very interesting tension for her. I think I've said that. Dawn, do you want to talk a little bit about, about um, the, the kind of the precious, the scarcity of archival material that illustrates everyday um, gay and lesbian life in a kind of pre-Stonewall pre era? You've, as an editor and a director, you've had to cope with that. Sure. Actually, it's mainly been as an editor on gay documentaries that I've really struggled with it a lot. Um, and I'm a little jealous of you because uh, at least there are a million photographs of Susan Sontag. <laughs> um, we worked on, I worked on one documentary um, which was about Harry Hay, who was the, an early civil rights, uh, gay civil rights leader. He was also a, an early communist, and so there are like no pictures of that period of his life, and there's no pictures of the next period of his life, and it's not until you get way down into his life that he started taking and saving photographs. We had one picture of the Manichean Society to cover like kind of a 15 minute period in the film. <laughs> and it's the editor's job to deal with this problem. <laughs> 
Um, on the flip side, what you get when you're telling gay history that you don't get in almost any other subject matter, I don't think, historically, are people who have never told their stories before. So the imagery to cover their stories is a huge challenge, but the gift is that often this will be the very first time someone is telling the story, even like they, they don't even tell it within their own families or to whoever they may have lived their life with. The most moving example of that for me was when I was editing paragraph 175, and there was a... This is, for those who don't know it, a documentary by Rob Epstein and, and Jeffrey Friedman uh, about the persecution of, uh, of homosexuals in the, not, under the Nazis. And there was a man who was about to turn 90 who had spent a good part of his 20s in the camp and had come out of the camp. He was a Gentile. German, came out of the camp, went right back into his family, his whole like closeted life. And so this was the first time in like 65, 70 years that A, anyone had ever thought to ask him to tell his story, but that he'd actually gone public and told it. And, and you just don't get the power of that sort of interview um, very often in, in other subjects because people tell them over and over and over again. Um, but I also wanted to say this, this challenge is not unique to gay history, the, the idea that there aren't images. Um, a lot of my life has been editing things about uh, gay history, but another big portion of it is editing films about early civil rights movements, um, both in the United States and in South Africa, and it's the same problem. Um, people, people who are, uh, whose history is not valued, it's not preserved in archives, who don't have a lot of money, who, and have parts of their history that they're actually afraid to have go public. Um, it's, it's, the same, it's the exact same challenge of trying to figure out how to tell it. Well, if I could just, you know, in terms of not being able to value that history, I, I can't tell you how many times that we've gone around the country with a, a project that we call Digital Diaspora Family Reunion Roadshow, which is a live event and an online Portal. And the whole point and purpose of it is to flesh out or, or you know, try to bring public some of these private archives. And people will come to that event, they'll be inspired, and then they'll tell us, you know, I wish you'd come a month earlier because I inherited a box of photographs from a parent or a, a grandparent or some other relative. I looked through these things, I didn't know who these people were, I don't have a lot of space, I threw them away. Right? Uh, when we were making this film, you know, one of the things that, that we really wanted to showcase uh, were exactly, as you said, this early civil rights period uh, beyond the public people. We wanted to look at the folks that were behind King. Um, and one of, the, one of the archives that came to our attention was an archive found in Philadelphia. Uh, it was just a family archive, but it was rich. It, it had about 1,500 photographs and they were almost all in that period from like 1947, 1948, uh, post-war, right on up through this, the, their participation in, the, in, in the, the March on Washington. But guess where they were found? They were found in a dumpster in Philadelphia. And it was just because a photographer who you know, had, had just, I don't know why he was dumpster diving, but he found them, <laughs> and he, he, he saw the value of them, and he preserved them. I think it is very we much. We have some dumpster footage too in our films. Not very much, but um, because when you when you see Berkeley went digital, they threw out all the 16 millimeter, and I saved a little. You know, it was like a rainy day in Berkeley, and it was this huge dumpster full of 16. Wow. So I mean, it's scary to think that whole communities' histories are uh, kind of at the at the random, uh, you know, at, at the whim of uh, somebody who might happen to have been on hand to record something. Someone who was. Um, brave enough, like like the photographer, the filmmaker that we mentioned, Hal O'Neill, to um, to document his own his own life and keep it under wraps until you know the 1990s rolled around and he thought somebody might might be interested in it. But it's also a fact that many of these communities, whether it's communities of color or queer communities, have to be responsible at least in the nascent stages of their development as social groups. They have to be responsible for their own history, for telling their own story. I mean, the GLBT History Center is not the product of some, you know, uh, state-funded museum. It's community historians who got together in already in the early 70s to say we're living through something important. We need to actually save crap, 
You know, we we know it. Someday it's going to be actually finding its way onto you know on, onto screens, and but but nobody else is going to do it for us. Um, and I think that's one of the issues that we get to when saying how has LGBT history making on on film begun to change is that the initial effort was simply filmmakers like Peter Adair and others saying. Um, we just need to have our stories on screen. It's, not, it's just m merely to f face forward to say, we need to document our lives as valid truths. We are here, to, to quote um, uh, uh, the title of a film, uh, many films. We are here, we were there. Um, right, so um, I'm, in thinking about the initial, the initial instinct of communities that have to sort of tell their own history, it, it is, it places a special burden on filmmakers, even now, 30, 40 years down the line, in terms of um, the gay liberation movement, if you want to call it that, um, it places a special burden, because um, oftentimes we are the first time storytellers. So I, I'm curious for any of you who've had to address it, um, do you feel a special burden in capturing those stories that you mentioned, for example, Dawn, of people coming out essentially for the first time? You know, I've always been in the role of the editor listening to those stories afterwards, to tell you the truth. So I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question. But it did, um, the same question popped in my head when you were talking about Susan and wanting that part of her life to be so private, how you grappled that with that yourself in making it extremely public. Well, you know, I was actually thinking about my student film, I made a film about American women who served in Vietnam. and. These women, no one had ever, a couple of them had been, you know, had been in the media in some way, but one of these women, no one had ever bothered to come talk to her. And I, I think it was completely life-changing for me to just go and sit with her and listen to what she had to say. But what was, I'm getting confused here. The question is, when someone's telling an out story for the first time, what is, what is your responsibility to it? Well, you know, I actually had this very serious argument at the beginning of making the Sontag film um, with someone who's prominent in the world of documentary and women's filmmaking, et cetera, about whether or not the dead have a right to privacy. Um, and I decided, and I don't know if I would change my mind, but I decided that Susan Sontag, having sold her papers to UCLA, did not have the right to privacy because she had violated her own privacy, and then her son published some of that stuff. But, you know, and I actually think that there's something kind of profound that Sontag did have such a closet, but that she really wanted to be known once she was gone. You know, there's, there's, you know the, the queer stuff is all over the papers if you go down to UCLA. So, you know, I don't know if the dead do have the right to privacy, but I think there's something sad about being in the closet your whole life, and then, you know, once you're deceased, sort of flinging open the closet doors. I don't know if I'm even talking about what you want to talk well, about. I, I, I wouldn't even <laughs> limit it to, to, quote, history. Because one of the things, uh, you know, how many people here have uh, video and photographs on your cell phones right now? Right? Raise a hand. Okay. How many of you are running out of space on those cell phones? And how many of you have deleted images and video? Right? That's our history being destroyed. <laughs> what we like to tell young people, and, and all people, frankly, is that we have a duty to be archiving our lives. Because we never know what will be, quote, history, but all of us are contributing to the creation of it. And it, it wouldn't be surprising if in this room, one of your cell phones 200 years from now is the only thing that, that's going to be used or found that will define who these people were now. And we have to be thinking in an historical mindset, I think, uh, in terms of, of, of how we take images and what those images represent and what's going to happen to those images later. It, it, um, Nancy brings up something that we all as filmmakers have to deal with, and that is the, the rapid obsolescence of what we think of as these you know, pristine archival um, forms. And whether you work as an editor or um, any of us who've had to deal with the, the retrieval, or we think that we're actually you know, saving um, our, our history, but there are issues about what, e what formats our history is actually going to be, going to be saved in. I don't know if any of you have, have dealt with that um, directly. <laughs> the editor on the, the editor on the, on the stage. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, format questions. Hmm. <laughs> Can we talk about the HAL footage instead? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Which is in a beautiful 
special for that eight millimeter. Um, and correct me if I mis misremember this story, but Peter and I were struggling with how to tell early pre-Castro uh, gay San Francisco life in an interesting visual way. And out of the blue, I believe, he put, he put a call out on KQED. Yeah, this was, this was again the, the privilege at that time of having a broadcast platform. Most independent filmmakers at that point would not have had the ability to get a PSA out on you know, a major you know, megawatt uh, public broadcasting station to say, we're looking for images of the Castro and life, um, gay life in San Francisco um, pre and post Castro. So an older gentleman called Peter up, said, I don't know if you'd be interested in this, but I have old home movies that, you know, I don't know if he was thinking moving or thinking about throwing them away, but he'd never shown them to anyone outside of his own circle of friends and family. Um, he sent down a box of old little 8 millimeter reels. If I remember correctly, I brought in my old 8 millimeter projector, and we strung the first one up, and our mouths just dropped. <laughs> the guy had the most incredible eye. It was just stunningly beautiful footage and very, very intimate, which is so unusual for finding that kind of thing of gay history of people actually being physically affectionate in front of the camera, dancing together. And we were just besides ourselves. Um, I will never forgive myself for the fact that one of the real, part of one of the reels burned up in the projector and will never be seen. But there were quite a few of them. I can't believe you're admitting that in public. <laughs> you're forgiven. No, it was it was very. Uh, he happened to be visit. He had used to live in San Francisco and had been visiting a friend from Seattle. Uh, from Seattle, he was visiting here and happened to hear our PSA on the air and left a voicemail message saying, yeah, I've got something maybe you'd be interested in. And as it turns out, it's become, in some ways, in our little world of gay history documentary, because we, we did ask him to donate the footage to the GLBT Historical Society, it's become the kind of iconic or at least you know recognizable images of um, men dancing sort of tr uh, fun drag parties, um, uh, Swim, swimming parties, all in this beautiful color footage from, from the late 40s and early 50s. Um, and it's become sort of what we think of as that material. In fact, you've used it in, you use it in Big Joy, Thanks you used it in, in Sontag, obviously, you know, we used it in, in the Castro. And, and, yeah. and we found our main character, our protagonist in Big Joy, it's a film about James Broughton. We found shots of him in those parties, in the footage, wow. which was really coming full circle. Yeah. yeah. So it, it speaks to the, in sort of the scarcity of images like that, that even, that even those kinds of images be, start to define what we, you know, generations down the line remember as being, oh, what were, what were the 40s like for gays in San Francisco? And it's like, well, it's the Hal O'Neill footage. Um, that ha it has its own danger in a way of locking us in, which segues to what I actually was going to follow up with you, Stefan, on with this question of um, recreation and the need, the burden uh, to be faithful to what your documentary subjects were telling you, um, what their lives were like, versus the claims that the narrative and dramatic drive has to making an interesting film. And particularly when you move into the genre of docudrama, which you have, I would imagine that that tension is especially strong to shift something for the sake of, uh, for the, sake of the story. <clears throat> yes, here again, it was a <clears throat> sort of a special way because we had decided we do a fiction film. We had had many, many talks and interviews with Ruby and Danced to get to know their story. And then they officially told us it's okay <coughs> if you uh, take our story and tell it in a little bit different way for the fictionalized feature film. So then when we had to stop this idea and come uh, and invented the idea of uh, putting the two parts together, at that moment it got difficult. <laughs> Because the fiction film, we could have said, yes, uh, it's based on a true story, but, and so on. And in this case, it was not that clear anymore. Um, because like some figures in our film, they did not exist in the same way in reality. But now with Rebbe and Ernst uh, appearing in the film, uh, all had this uh, notion of being true, uh, the reality. Although we all know that also the documentary films uh, are... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> They're a creation of themselves. It's a recreation uh, based on something, what is it, truth or reality or whatsoever. So, um, 
at the very end of the film it still says uh, this the fictionalized parts allow uh, there we allow ourselves to uh, dramatize things which was important and uh, we went through the whole film with Ruby and Ernst deciding should we keep it like it is now or should we leave it uh, in a more open way and found this uh, final form that we have now and I think it's quite okay um, yeah to, to do it like this <laughs> I want to shift uh, the conversation a little bit to um, whose stories are being told. Uh, we talked about a little bit that the visual record is often uh, driven by the, the means to have cameras, movie cameras, uh, photographs, who actually owns that stuff to record their own history. And in terms of um, LGBT history, it was, you know, um, We've had a long history now of films that tell our history that is primarily a white and a white male history. So I'm wondering about um, what we're missing out on, how difficult it is to address um, the diversity of, of queer life when we're looking at uh, telling our own histories. Well, uh, we have another major film festival We'll, we'll, we'll keep their name nameless. Who just? Oh, no. uh, <laughs> All right, we can dish. <laughs> so Outfest, right? We're in Los Angeles. Outfest. Outfest has just announced their 2014 screenwriting fellows. Have you seen a picture of them? Describe it for us. There are no people that look like me. There are relatively few women. This is in L.A. L LA is 25% Latino, it's 13% African American, it's got a, a huge Asian population, and you mean to tell me that none of those folks could qualify to get into the 2014 Screenwriting Fellowship? All right, so that's our problem. Uh, when you look through gay media, who's there? Their tokenism in terms of women and people of color, but it's not them that are being the gatekeepers. It's not them that are being you know, focused on a, a, as the central protagonists or, or, or the central decision makers, and that's a problem. I'm going to turn to you, Nancy, because it, I, have a, I have a similar film festival story. Just this is maybe slightly an aside because it's not particularly gay, but I have two. I have a lesbian couple who wrote the music for my film. I call them privately my pet lesbian composers, but they're incredibly talented. I'm not supposed to say that in public. But I went to a, I went to a panel at another film festival that's not a gay film festival recently about film scoring, and there were six white men up on the panel. And then they started referring to all the potential film directors that they would work with as he. And I, I had a kind of meltdown, and I said, you can't do this, it's 2014, like where are the women? And it turns out that 2% of American film and television, 2%, is scored by women. I mean, so this is, we're not talking about film scoring here, we're talking about queer history, but, um, you know, when, when, the, when Brother Outsider was on PBS, there had been fewer than five films that focused on a queer American of color in the last 20 years prior to that, <laughs> because I counted on public television, and I said, where's the P, you know, in public television? <laughs> But, you know, I've also, there was a meeting at ITBS. Johnny, were you there? There was an ITBS meeting about um, LGBT films on public television. I don't know, three or four years ago, were you there? Um, this is Johnny Simons over there. <laughs> um, very noted colleague of mine. Um, and, you know, there was even a discussion of like, maybe it's not worth putting queer stories on public television because, you know, can you tell the truth about gay lives? And you know, one of our advisors at one point wanted us to slightly censor the story of how Bayard Russell was arrested in 1953 with two men in the backseat of a car. Um, you know, because the actual police document is kind of obscene. Um, and and we we did. I don't know if we made the right decision or the wrong decision, but but there is some sense. And this is a slightly awkward question, but like, you know, can you put queer stories on public television and actually tell the truth about? queer lives that may not involve one partner that you're married to for 40 years. Well, if we're gonna talk about public television, which is also one of the major funders for a lot of our work, uh, by default, actually, um, 
I mean, they've been talking about diversity since they were formed. And there's basically been a brand new head of diversity at PBS uh, every 18 to 19 months, or 18 to 24 months. They never seem to get it right. And they always make the same claim. Well, our audience won't accept this, or our audience isn't interested in that. So fine, all you get on PBS is Downtown Abbey, and everything else is relegated to a very small little sliver somewhere else. And then they'll keep decrying the fact that, oh, we don't have enough diversity, and it's only because Congress starts to bang that drum and they, they get worried about their funding. So uh, really, until we have a, a sea change in attitude, because I think they're leaving a lot of audience off the table. I mean, we talk a lot in making, in making our films about validating our lives, and, and that validation comes from seeing the representation of those lives in public spaces. It makes us feel like we belong to the culture, we belong to the society. And if we can't get that validation, if we can't get that representation, then we look elsewhere for it, and we're not gonna tune into PBS. I just want to say that things are changing. Um, not fast enough, but they're, I mean, New Black was just on PBS last night or the other night. Um, there are a lot of really important training grounds that are sprouting up for other people to tell their stories for women. There's this great organization here in the Bay Area called Quack, Quackmac, I think Quack is how you Quack pronounce Quack. it. I've seen some killer films. Quack in the house. <laughs> uh, and, um, over on your side of the country, I know some of the best um, non-white men looks at gay life recently have come out of Stanley Nelson's training um, program, I forget what it's called, but Firelight Media. Um, what it really comes down to, though, still is not that people don't want to tell these stories and their own stories, I think. Uh, it's getting the funding. And consistently, I see it as an editor. I get calls from all kinds of people who are interested in hiring a professional editor to make their film um, about all different kinds of subjects. And the people who consistently end up having the money to hire me tend to be white men who are already established in their fields. And the stories that they're telling tend to be inclusive, but in a very limited way. I mean, I can't tell you how many programs I've worked on where it's like, OK, well, here's the story, and you know, 10 of our major characters are all white men, so we have to find a woman uh, to put in. Or, you know, we need to find a black person or a Latino person. And so it, it's, it is inclusive, but it's a, there's still this level of tokenism going on, on on a lot of the shows. It's not the main story. Right, so there's an interesting um, relationship, in a way, between um, the, the stories that storytellers are interested in uh, and uh, what we end up even having as a record of our own history. It's, and this is where I guess I keep coming back to this question of the, the burden of the storytellers. Now, Nancy, early on, you made a decision as a, a Caucasian female to make a film about an African-American gay male. Um, you were just interested in that story. Um, I wonder how often the flip is true, though. Uh, well, um, we worked with an editor who actually has worked with Stanley as well, and, and he said the problem is not you making a film about Byron Russell. He said the question is whether I could make a film as a black gay man about Gold of My Year. It was a photograph of Gold of My Year, <laughs> and it's a really interesting question. And I guess the question is, you know, how much of it is gatekeeping and lack of resources, and how much of it is interest. And you know, I really struggled with that question with Rustin, and I felt like someone had to tell the story before everyone died, and that I felt like his history was my history too. But that was a pretty, you know, for some people who could be an obnoxious answer for me. Um, yep, go ahead. Well, and it also, I think, comes into the nuances that, that you know, with all due respect, I mean, people's perspective is shaped by their life experiences. And we can be interested in a lot of stories, and we'll bring the perspectives that have developed as, as a result of our own life experiences to those stories. Um, in telling the story of these black photographers, I mean, some of these photographers are, are extremely well known. Their stories have been told before, but not by us. We, in telling their stories, see things differently. We see different shading. We see different nuances in their stories that have a specific 
reference or, or, or specific resonance with the audience that we're trying to reach. And so in, in layering this story that we put together, we made sure to hit certain notes because we knew that certain parts of the audience are gonna, you know, they're, that's really gonna hit them. Whereas for other people, it'll be interesting, but it's not gonna hit them the same way. And I think that it's extremely important who tells the story, extremely important. Can I just add one thing, which is that I've noticed that very few men of gay or straight make films about women, but women make films about men and women. And one of the things I used to say with the Russian film was like, no one ever gives me credit for having spent so much time thinking about Byard's sex life, which is not something I could directly understand from my own experience. You know, and I would like, I want some credit. <laughs> I never got the credit. that it may be the exception that proves the rule, but many of you may have seen last night at the Castro we showed Violette, which is Martin Provo, a, a Caucasian French director, a male who made a biopic, very lush and, and quite um, uh, sumptuous biopic about the lesbian writer Violette Leduc. But as I say, maybe the exception that proves the rule. You wanted to say something, Stefan? Um, maybe this doesn't fit exactly into it, but as a foreigner from Switzerland uh, with a sort of a look from the outside is still something I, I would like to share relating to this subject. Also back home in Switzerland I am and I was with doing this film sort of an observer of the homosexual scene in Zurich in Switzerland and quite often I realized how much to be honest animosity there is between the gay man and the lesbian woman. Uh, uh, and I was or the gay and the lesbian, um, because mostly the gay are men and the lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, we can go into that later. Anyhow, um, <laughs> are you talking about animosity now or historically? Now, oh, okay. Or like once I heard Ruby and Ernst talk to the producer and say, "Did you realize how many women are on the uh, on the staff now with Stefan?" Uh, um, and I asked, yeah, why not? Ah, oh, it's always so complicated with women. Don't you think that's, that's uh, shouldn't we? Uh, and so I was quite surprised. Um, at the end, they were really surprised how well the women did their job. Uh, I wasn't so surprised because I had made this experience before. And uh, to tell you, coming here to this Frameline Festival, it was surprising to me to find that uh, it's that much uh, going back and forth between men and women here, uh, lesbian and gay. I haven't seen the same thing in, in Zurich. I think you are further on here. <laughs> that's that's ni nice to get some of that validation. Exactly. Um, uh, pardon me while I'm, my brain just went uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the next subject. I guess. Um, We've talked a bit about um, sort of the, the, the burden of representation uh, and uh, what we have to bring each of us as, as storytellers. Um, and I'm, I want to, before we open up, out to the audience, tackle one other area, and that is simply the form of historical storytelling. I mentioned briefly that early on, we as, as gay people, were just so, so um, relieved to see simple documentation front you know, face to camera, word is out, basically people telling their own stories. Then came fabulous, what I still might call traditional narrative documentaries like um, uh, Rob Epstein and, and uh, Richard Schmeekin's Times of Harvey Milk, um, which certainly is like a, a seminal gay history documentary, um, pardon the term. Uh, and, but gradually we've seen a kind of loosening of the genres and sort of the narrative possibilities and, and an opening out. Um, a couple of years ago, Rob and Jeff made Howl, which was a very interesting um, film with, with the animation as well as with sort of a, a very fully realized recreations of the, of the Allen Ginsberg poem and the, 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 the trial. Uh, Stefan, Stefan, you have now made a very interesting docudrama and I'm curious whether that's just because we're getting more uh, comfortable with our own stories that we could start to play around with uh, the narrative forms, or where is history storytelling going? <laughs> Resounding <laughs> silence from the, yeah. from the group. Too general a question. Documentaries are dull. <laughs> they have to be enlivened. 
we have to bring something fresh. We have to, we have to make them engaging. And the subject matter uh, is, is certainly complex enough. And I think that the technology is giving us an ability to explode the form. So one of the biggest problems that we had making 12, uh, the uh, Through a Lens Darkly, 12 Disciples to a certain extent, uh, the one before this was a little bit like your documentary. We had a lot of, of quote, recreations. And we got tons of pushback from our funders, uh, public television, on that because they, they wanted a straight down the middle uh, historical uh, you know, linear story that, that has these experts and the talking heads and the little archival images and like, that's good, that's the way it's supposed to be. And we were just absolutely, you know, it was st just stultifyingly dull for us to do that. So with this film, with all the photographs, we went through 15,000 images in order to come up with the 915 that are actually in the film, most of which have never been seen before because they've been in private family archives. And we, there was no way that we were going to lose the emotional impact of those, looking at those images, which are just so compelling, by going through some kind of a linear documentary story. So they, they could not understand this film. You know, when, we, when we turned in the early rough cuts, we turned them in in a way that got us to the next level of funding, and then we went back into the edit room and made our film. <laughs> Interesting. I just think if, you know, film is a creative medium, and people don't want to keep telling the same or different stories the same way. You want to play with the form. You want to get inspired by other ways of telling a story in a new, fresh way. I know when I... Um, when I watch documentary, I, I get the information I want from a traditional form often, but I get the inspiration that I'm looking for when I'm tackling a new story almost always from more experimental filmmakers. Um, John Grayson is somebody I turn to over and over again just to go like, wow, I could do anything, <laughs> um, and kind of blow open what I feel are my own, like, you get set, you get kind of stuck in a certain way of, um, your first assumptions are, oh, well, I can do it this way, we can do a reenactment, we can, you know, just to like, it's, it's good to open up. We, we actually have a lot of experimental techniques in our film, and I hired an experimental filmmaker to make sequences for our film, and we also tried to make it thematic and not chronological, and we have a panel of advisors, including a number of historians, and they were furious with us when we sent them this nonlinear. I mean, it was not, it was not completely crazy, but it was, you know, it was sort of associative, and so the film became more chronological. It's not completely chronological, but it's much, much more than it used to be because, you know, because we had so much pushback about that, and so people are willing. They didn't mind the experimental imagery, even though they had questions about it. But they really wanted. You know, I mean, it's true, we are all born, we have our experiences, we die. So, you know, the, the chronology is kind of set for all of us. But we were, you know, pushing against that a bit. But that's not a tricky, not a tricky thing to do with documentary. Um, we've, we've got plenty of time to, to open the conversation out. The one drawback is that uh, we don't have a roving mic. So we're going to rely on you to um, project <laughs> well. And I may repeat the, the uh, question so that um, our, our document our, our own documentary person can, can uh, catch the question. Yes, uh, let's start here. Question for Nancy. Could you go into a few more details about uh, Sun Tank sale of her archives to UCLA as well as her son's sale? More details on Sontag's sale of her archives to UCLA as well as her son's sale. <laughs> well, I don't know exactly what you want to know about them, but... Um, How it came about? I think she decided before she died that she wanted to leave some money to her son, so... Um, she, I'm not, I really was not, in, I wasn't making the film at the time that this happened, so um, all I know is, I suspect that there was probably a bidding war between the Ransom Center at University of Texas, which has a lot of papers by, you know, American writers in UCLA, and I, I assume they found a donor who would buy them for the university. Uh, we had a lot of trouble, actually, with the archive, uh, which has somewhat changed its policies, but at one point, um, they refused to put in my Xeroxing order. <laughs> And uh, I sent somebody down and said, don't tell them that you work with me, and they were able to Xerox. And you know, this is, I think, illegal in the state of California. That's a public university, and I'm a taxpayer here. And I went through quite a lot of effort to you know, think about actually taking them to court, because I felt like this was an outrageous thing for them to do. And they were afraid that I was going to violate the copyright, um, which is very complicated. 
Um, and I actually talked to, the, there's now a new archivist, and I talked to him and he did apologize to me recently. <laughs> I mean, he said we probably wouldn't have succeeded if we'd sued them, but um, I just couldn't believe that, you know, at, and at the time I, was, I thought this film was gonna wind up on public television. So for a public university to deny access for an historical documentary that, you know, would probably be the film on the subject, for public television, and there's, you know, we have several hundred thousand dollars of public money. We got money from both the NEA and the NEH. And I just said, this is an outrage. But, you know, it would have, we probably still be involved in the lawsuit. And I was also told that the lawyers at UCLA would love me to sue them because most of the things that they deal with are like, you know, contractors building buildings. You know, the First Amendment issues don't happen that often. <laughs> so anyway, that's not a some of your question, but. Yes, on the aisle. Um, for I saw the film last weekend and really enjoyed it. I wanted to, um, to me it felt as though um, this goes back to something that was addressed earlier about who's telling the story, but to me it felt as though a white audience wasn't actually the number one um, audience that your film was geared for, which I, which I found really unique, and I wanted to hear you speak to that. So, yeah, not to speak to the issue of um, whether your film is uh, primarily meant for um, audiences of color, it, it is. So it's very perceptive because we made this film with a young black male in mind. We wanted to get into his head that you have a history. You have something to be proud of. You have something worth living for. And it has nothing to do with the world out there. Look inside. We all stand on the shoulders of people who come before us. And the other thing that was important for us is that even if that young black male had no idea who his father was or who his history was, as one of the subjects uh, in our films says, and I don't know if we made it into the final film, but as one of the interviewer's subjects said, you know, even if it's not my family, it could be my family. We wanted to give them images that they could relate to, images that would stand in the stead of what may be absent in their own lives. So yes, we made the film for that person in particular and all of their permutations that were out there. And the rest of you, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> Hi, I'm James Chambers. My film, Citizen Change, screened on this screen at Fairlane 36. Uh, I heard a um, inherent contradiction in some of the comments that were made, and I'd like to have the panelists explore that somewhat. Uh, as a gay man, I have just completed a short documentary about lesbians. There's not a single man in the film. And I'm, pre, um, I'm in pre-production for a film about the first lesbian, elect, I'm sorry, the first transsexual elected judge in the United States. I heard <coughs> issues about who should be telling what stories, who has the right to do it, and who has the right background or knowledge to do it. And I'd like to hear what some of you think about that question. Did everybody hear the question? No. Well, I don't think it's a question of who has a right or not right. I think everyone has the right to tell stories. All I'm suggesting really is that certain folks have a particular perspective that we're not familiar with because they don't necessarily come to the forefront very often. Uh, and their storytelling will be different, even if it's exactly the same subject that's being covered. Um, and from a perspective of, of an audience person, I'm very interested in those perspectives that are unique and different from the status quo or, or, or the, 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 the perspective that is, that's represented uh, more often. Uh, so I tend to seek out those, those hidden voices and, and I think in terms of you know, telling black stories, I mean, black folks have to do that. They just have to. You know, it, it's like that old African ad, uh, adage, you know, when, when the, um, the lion tells the, the story, you know, then, then they'll be the victor. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, it's the hunter who's telling the story. Um, it's not to denigrate the hunter's story, but it is to elevate the lion story, and I think that's really what, what in terms of, of trying to privilege voices, we, we need to privilege perspectives that we don't get enough of. Don, were you going to add something here? Oh, I just wanted to say, I, I hope 
but we weren't, or at least I certainly didn't mean to say anyone had any specific right to tell any story. I think anybody should be able to tell whatever story they want to tell. Um, but I think it's it, it's very true that there's stories come from either an insider perspective or an outsider perspective. And I think they're both equally valid and, and very different. Um, and they result in very different films. Uh, I, I wanted to just add one thing that keeps coming up for me. I'm having like major flashbacks sitting in this room. You mentioned that your film showed here. My first film showed here. Um, 10 years before that, I sat in the most amazing screening I think I've ever been in, which was Marlon Riggs' first um, screening of Tongues Untied in this room, which was, just will never be equal. So. And I say that was 25 years ago this year. Wow. 1989 in this in this very space. Talk about telling it from a new perspective, breaking the form. I mean that and and emotional power that screening had at all. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the back. David Weissman. Um, coming from a vantage point of being both a programmer of queer documentaries and a maker of queer documentaries, one of the things that isn't being talked about a lot, except just momentarily, is the question of our, our audience. And I think at any festival in the world, whether it be a gay film festival or not, there's clearly a graying demographic of people who go to movies. And uh, certainly within American society, there is a, a lack of interest and awareness of the importance of knowing history. So what we're doing is we're, I mean, we're all feeling like there's important stories that need to be told. And I think the question is, who is our audience and how do we reach our audience when many of that audience that I think particularly younger people are very hard to access through the media that we are creating, um, both the festivals and, uh, and the documentary uh, format. And I'm just sort of curious how, I mean, I, well, I, I, we're all, I think, you know, to, 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 to sort of follow up on, on this comment about the graying of the audience, whether it's festival audiences or public television audiences, audiences that come to communal spaces like this to watch films together as opposed to sitting at our screens. Are any of you as makers feeling, the, in a way, the pressure to find a way to communicate your stories to this, to, in other ways, um, you've got a digital di diaspora project that could potentially um, live only on the web or on in, in a digital way. And many others of you have made, you know, traditional long-form documentaries that are ideally screened in beautiful, you know, situations like a, like the Castro Theater or on, um, in, on on HBO or on public television. Do we have the responsibility to be making things in sort of bite-sized, you know, three-minute webisode nuggets? Does that is that what is that where history is going, David? Maybe you're I'm, I'm overstating your the the ultimate you know the the end of your question, but I'm wondering if that's what we're facing. I just want to say that there is a positive thing, which is that um, a lot of students get to see these films in classes, and maybe they are being forced to see them. But um, th I had this interesting week a couple of years ago. We had a 30-minute um, sample of the Sontag film in one week. I showed it to a group of um, learning and retirement folks in Berkeley and a group of freshmen at Sonoma State. And some of the freshmen were like playing with their iPhones and whatnot while the thing was going. But some of them came up to me and they're like, why don't we know about Susan Sontag? I'm really excited. When is your film coming out? I can't wait to see this. And you know, it was actually this real sign of hope uh, because you know, for those particular kids, something hit them. And I remember um, when when the Vito Russo film, was that last year or the year before? Two years ago. Yeah, so there was, I don't know if any of you were there, but um, there was a 17-year-old kid in the audience who said that he had, you know, was only kind of recently starting to come out and didn't know anything about Vito Russo and had just shown up at Frameline. And it was so beautiful. What is the film maker, David? Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Schwartz. Jeffrey Schwartz, I'm, I'm getting confused. That's the other guy. Jeffrey Schwartz said, well, thanks for coming because I made this film for you. And every time I tell the story, I start crying because it's so great. I mean, you know, it's, it's not necessarily easy to reach a 17-year-old with a 100-minute film, but it is possible. Well, I think getting to that point, you, you have to, to have them in mind, and you have to present them with something that they can resonate with. I mean, so I think the reason that our audiences are gray, whether it's gay audiences or, or PBS or, or even just uh, for the multiplexes, is that we keep feeding them we, in a generic sense, filmmakers, keep feeding them gruel. 
we don't really <laughs> give them anything, right? So you know, it, it becomes a, a self-selecting audience and the, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. I think we have left, as I said before, huge swaths of audience off to the side to fend for themselves because we're not servicing them. And if we bring product out and we're targeting them, and yes, we created a project to go out and lasso them and pull them in one way, shape, or form or another, um, and it works. But when you do that, they have an interest. They, they find that representation that gives them that validation and they respond to it. Stefan. It's quite an interesting question. In my case, it was, uh, to be clear about this, two gay producers starting off the project with a gay uh, writer, director, and they uh, started fighting about the project and uh, couldn't solve it, so they left the director and they were looking around for a new one and they found me and asked me if I would do this. And um, for me, a, a key thing was uh, Revian Danced made a homepage and the title of it is, It's All About Love. And love affects everybody. <laughs> and for me, this was like the key into a whole subject and into digging into it. And it was always clear for the producers they wanted to make a film for all audiences, as, a, as, uh, as much as for a, not for the community, uh, for a, a film that should go to the cinemas and try to become, a, to, to really get a, a big audience. And maybe, uh, I mean, there was a special thing in Berlin now when we had the world premiere of the film. It was the first time that a Teddy Award film also won the, the Audience Award. And, uh, and for me, this was, uh, for all of us, of course, very, very rewarding. And at the premiere, one, uh, a friend of the one gay actor came to me and said, it was fantastic and I could tell that you are not gay. <laughs> I said, how can you tell? How? I, um, no, I can tell it. <laughs> because if you would have been gay, you, it would have been more uh, larmoyant, or uh, like more, you would have digging into it, more tragic and so, and you kept sort of a distance, which made us uh, easier to go with the whole story. I, I don't quite understand the whole thing, but it was funny to hear about it. And, uh, and we had a subject now in Zurich with, uh, there's the Pink Apple Festival, you have to be careful, maybe you know the people, yes, sometimes. Uh, they wanted the film as the premiere very badly. And the huge uh, distribution company in Switzerland that has picked up the film said, no, we want to release in the cinema, not in the, that small side festival. I, I stayed totally out of the discussion. <laughs> that wasn't my decision. And uh, they were so angry from the festival because it was even in the newspaper, um, gay film is not allowed to be shown at festival. <laughs> but it should have said, uh, film is not allowed to be shown at gay festival. Or, bo bo yeah, it was quite a funny thing. But well, it does get, a lot of this is circling around the same um, tension between universality of, of subject matter versus universality of audiences. And particularity, we have this responsibility to tell, as we've been talking about, tell our own history. But sometimes, if we choose a format or a forum like uh, public television, which is reaching however many, you know, 346 stations and hopefully, you know, 250 million viewers, it's the bluntest of mass media where the where the obligation is going to be to speak to everybody. And, and Dawn, you and I had this issue in, in making the Castro <laughs> neighborhood show. First of all, it was seen initially as parochial. Why does the nation need to see a story about a San Francisco neighborhood? And then it's like, no, this is actually internationally significant queer history. We're not going to use the Q word because at that time in 1997, it was still, you know, like problematic for, um, for, uh, for public television. Um, but in fact, my experience with that program was that the moment in the film that made people realize that this was not an inside baseball story that was kind of a nod to the diversity of public television and subject matter, but it was really only for the queer audience, was when we showed 
the story of the neighborhood as it was settled by Scandinavians and European immigrants and their attachment to this neighborhood as it began to transition into being a gay neighborhood. And we found this, you know, this alumni group from Eureka Valley who met in some place out, out in, in, the, in the fog in Daly City and remembered the old times. And it was very genuine and it was very old San Francisco. And I think a lot of audiences that presumed that they were going to be, maybe straight audiences, that presumed they were going to be on the outside of the story, actually, in a way, were invited to enter into it and could see themselves in, in this film. And I got one cynical question once from a programmer saying, well, you know, you, you must have put that in there, you know, because you knew you needed to speak to a, to a universal audience. Like, no, I put that in there because I grew up in San Francisco pre-Castro. This was my interest. Those, those are like my, my relatives on there. So that gets to the question of who's telling the story and the sensitivities that can make a story either universal or particular. And there's not one that's better than another, but sometimes there is a disconnect between the intentions of a filmmaker and the form in which they're choosing to, to, to show the film. You can't get the most general audience for a film that is meant for uh, to tell a particular story sometimes. But, uh, I, I was going to actually throw the question back at you, David, because I'm curious. Are gay film festivals, the, what you think of as more, it's funny to use the word, but traditional gay film festivals, <laughs> <laughs> aging more? Are they graying more? Because when I go to the Quackback Festival, it's full of young people, or when I go to CAM, or you know, a lot of different, it, it seems to be particular to certain kinds of festivals, and is it because young people don't feel like they need a gay film festival in the same way, or? I can't speak to that part of the question, but I think that there are certain festivals that are specifically designed uh -huh. um, I think the general themed film festival, certainly Portland International, I would assume also San Francisco International, will probably have a similar situation of bringing audiences. As far as us offering them not you know, good enough material to entice them, I completely disagree with that. I think that there's a lot of great material, and when they come and see it, they are moved by it. I mean, I think that all of you have made films that are not necessarily designed to attract young people. But when they do come, they do have the experience, whether it be in classrooms or at festivals, of finding the richness in the work. I think it's a, just a, it's a cultural issue within our society in general and also within the queer community. I mean, I made We Were Here for Gay Men as my core. The core of my onion of, the, of intention uh, was for the whole age range of gay men because I'm really committed to our history surviving and things being passed on because we as a community are really the only minorities that can't learn our heritage and our culture and our history from our parents. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, it brought your audience broadens out from there, and I'm really glad that you made your film for young black men and, and are able to say that as an intention. And um, so, I don't know, I just think it's very challenging, and I think that you know, part of it is the, is the <laughs> core question, too. I mean, and I've had this conversation with students. What stimulates an interest in history? Is it something you learned from your parents? Is it something that happened just as a light bulb went off when you were in a classroom? Did it come in a conversation? And I don't think, I mean, everybody has a different answer to that. But I think that it's something to, that matters to me as, a, as someone who makes films about queer history and, and programs them. How do we find inviting, ways to invite people into, into that world so that once they have the experience, they'll want another one? I mean, I think that's part of the key is, is to you know, seduce people and then have them realize that, oh, this is really, I want more. Oh, and make sure, if you will, that the people that, you know, the histories that are being, being spoken about are histories that are inclusive and diverse. Absolutely. You know, because it, it, it still surprises me, uh, you know, looking at the publications within our community. And, and if you were to go back, you know, I guess I came out a long time ago. Um, but looking at those publications and then putting them beside publications today, it's like, wow, you know, I wasn't represented then, I'm not represented now. Nothing's changed. It's still a very narrow slice of what we consider gay. And I guess when gay people are able to be diverse and inclusive and to have a full representation of their history, and it's not just one particular slice of that history, then I think we'll begin to diversify and broaden our audiences too. Let's get a couple more questions um, here in the front row. Uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> as you can see, I'm an old man, 80 years old plus, and 
So I was at it in, in the gay world at a time when most of you weren't. And so when we see gay history, for when I was young, we always see Royal Madrid plays, we see the paper doll, we see the uh, black cat. And like, you know, like this, there weren't many gay bars in San Francisco, never more than four or five when I was of an age to go to a gay bar. So we were a little tiny group. And never has any of you in your filmmaking done what he's done for the black community. And I loved his movie because of what he did. I taught labor history for many years, and I taught a labor film course. And I was concerned about the working class, the people who are not going to be in films that we see by and large. That's it. We leave out the bulk of the gay society. When I was going to those bars, I had many, many friends who never set foot in a gay bar, who never were part of a structured gay community. They had their own friends and lives. If they did anything, it was to go someplace, you know, where they had uh, the glory holes, maybe to the baths, but that was it. Now, we don't think of those people who are the bulk of the gay population up to fairly recent times they are totally left out of anything any of you have done. Fortunately, he has seen within the black community that there are a whole lot of people, not only are blacks left out of a lot of our history, but most of the people in the black community are left out totally. Good, I'm gonna pause you there because it's a terrific point and that is um, class representation in, in gay history and, what's, and the stories that are being left out it's a terrific comment. I don't know if anybody wants to wants to pick up on it or, or respond. I just, it was nice to see Alan Maruvi up there. Yes, uh, thank you for mentioning um, in, in in the Castro documentary, which um, there was a, a um, quote that you saw from Alan Barabe, who was a community historian, who when he passed away was doing a, a, a major research project on. Um, uh, the Cooks and Stewards Union and its its gay history, and also who wrote the book Coming Out Under Fire, which was about um, coming out during World War II, from which Arthur Dong made a fantastic documentary, which did cross classes because obviously the military was a was a multi class uh, enterprise. But uh, taking nothing away from your point that that still working class uh, gay stories are still um, or middle class. I'm talking about people who didn't go to the bars. All of you have shown us pictures of people who go to the bars, okay. people who have led that lifestyle. What about all those folks, and a lot of them are rich, a lot of them are poor, a lot of them are working class, a lot of them are middle class. Good, good point. I, I want to make sure to get a couple of other comments in. Excellent, excellent points. Does it, do you? thought about I mean, I'm thinking about almost all the films that I've seen about gay history or worked on that include women, um, and I think most of them were working class, just because most lesbians were working class until very recently. Um, Before I long. think maybe you're thinking about the clips that were shown, but certainly lots of films that I've been involved in and that I've seen as an audience member um, deal with gay history that's not bar specific. Um, yes? Uh, question about further uh, viewability of the films that were in the festival. Uh, for example, the tour of Lens Darkly. Many of us miss the film. Yeah. We'd like to spread the word about it, but where would people be able to see it in the future? Let's do that quickly, round, uh, just a quick round round run. So the film is going to be distributed theatrically, uh, starting in film form in New York on August 27th. Uh, first run features is going to pick it up and take it from, th from there, and so it will be out uh, theatrically starting in the fall. If you miss it then, uh, it will be on PBS uh, in February of 2015. And <laughs> Wolf video has the circle, and uh, it will be a theatrical release in fall here in the States. It will be at different uh, festivals, Outfest and others, and you can come to Switzerland uh, and release it in uh, September. Well, well Wolf, Wolf Video is distributing it in the US. Um, Dawn, you want to talk about um, uh, Big Joy? Joy, which is the most recent gay film I worked on that was at last year's festival, just came out on DVD. You can see it there. 
Uh, it's also on iTunes and all those. It's, it's all over the place, and it's still coming. It, it's coming back to the Roxy actually uh, this fall, so you can see it there. I don't know if it will ever be on television. It's I'd be shocked if it's on public television. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good segue to you. I, I encourage people to see Big Joy. It's a wonderful film. Um, so the Rustin film is available on Netflix if anyone wants to see it, and the Sontag film will be at festivals and then will be broadcast on HBO probably in December. Great. Yes, and the blue. Yes. Esther Hoffenberg is in the audience here. Uh, Sorry. Here. And she did a wonderful film called Vi Violette Le Duc, which is uncovering this history of this amazing writer uh, it, who did La Batarde and Therese and Isabel. And, and I just want to kudos to her. But also, you know, that I think uncovering like our history is just so essential. So I just thank you for this panel and to talk about these issues. And you know, I'm thinking of Barbara Hammer and all of these people who are doing this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To Esther Hoffenberg, who had her American premiere of Violet Le Duc in Pursuit of Love uh, just uh, earlier this morning at, at the Castro Theater, a lovely screening. Yes, sir. Um, uh, one or several of you mentioned funders before and how difficult it is to get funding. Uh, is there uh, a project that's near and dear to your heart that you have not been able to get funding for that you're just sort of saying, I wish I could get funding to make this? What, wh what's on your mind? <coughs> I'm sure drawers full of projects. I was going to say, are, are you maybe, a funder? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, specifically in, in the area of, of, of queer storytelling, perhaps, or uh, gay history, is there anything that, that is burning to be told that hasn't yet gotten traction? Well, we're, our, our next project is called Tears from Lagos, and it's the story of uh, a woman from, from Lagos, Nigeria, who's coming to America in search of her trans brother who's become lost, um, and, uh, and she's trying to, uh, to reunite with him. For you, Nancy or Dalton, Nancy, you're, you're, just, you're probably still my, trying my to finish joke, your funding. My jo yeah, I'd be happy to accept money for the Sontag project and our outreach work. Um, I mean, it took five years to raise the money for the Sontag film, and I was repeatedly told that we wouldn't raise the money, and we're still trying to raise the money. And I do have a friend here from the foundation world, so but I think the foundation world is sometimes 20 or 30 years behind on some of this stuff. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not knocking any particular foundation, but it, it is interesting, and, and even the public entities such as the NEH, I mean, I was told there's no way you could get a production grant from the NEH to make a film about Susan Sontag that's too out there for them and I don't you know who knows what happens at, in those panels but um, it's it's very serious it's obviously full of humanities content we did get a like a scripting grant but we got turned down twice for production yeah. well and if we could just you know, talk a little bit about what's happening the change in, in the foundation funding it's all becoming cause related so you know it, if your film isn't about saving the whales or saving the environment or dealing with some kind of social justice, burning, burning social justice issue where you can change the world, you have to craft your narrative in a way that they will think it does. Otherwise, there's no <laughs> well, I think Each of you in your own way has changed our world a little bit for the better. I want to thank all of you for your work. I want to thank 